Well, hello. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. I also wanted to welcome everyone who will be watching us from home today or uh, our session later. Um, I'm really pleased to speak with Nathan Wolf today. Um, my first question for you really is just, how are you doing? <laughs> you know, you're a pandemic expert. We're now 18, 18 months into this pandemic. How are you doing? Well, I, I could ask the same to you. You've been very busy. Even today, I think I saw a new article drop. But I'm doing I'm well. I'm like many that, that were fortunate to be able to do work from home and um, live in a city, San Francisco, that dealt fairly well with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm curious for you. You are someone who has warned about pandemics for a very long time and has talked about what they might look like. Um, you know, we're going to talk a bit about the future and hopefully how to prevent the next pandemic because I think it's pretty safe to say we don't want to live through this again. It's been a really long and isolating year and tragic for some people. But, you know, as someone who has been thinking about this for a long time, has COVID played out like you predicted or have there been things that surprised you? Well, the way that I think about these events, we, we model them. And so you can actually model a whole range of different potential events. We're actually at the point where we can conceive of modeling certain parameters, certain characteristics of all future events. But the nuance, the idiosyncrasy um, that plays out is always something that's a bit unexpected. For example, some of the political dimensions, some of the informational features were things that are just nuance and that you'd have to really model in a way that was a movie or an art piece to get to that quality of nuance. Yeah, I feel like what was so hard is um, people would often ask me as a journalist, what's going to happen? What's going to happen in the spring? What's going to happen in the fall? And the answer is, it's not just like, you're not just plugging in numbers about the virus, right? It also depends on human behaviors, and human behavior is so, so hard to model. I think that's a, a really important point, which is, Often we think about the solutions to these problems as being within the domain of science. And certainly science has demonstrated in such a remarkable way its capacity to manage this type of phenomena through vaccines. While we failed in other ways we'll talk about. Yeah. But I think it's important to recognize that the kinds of health communication, risk communication topics are deeply central to how these events play out. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think that these will be areas that will be quite critical in the future. How do we have a risk literate population? I live in San Francisco and I have a little boy that's five and a little boy who's six years old. And my five-year-old um, was out playing. And the reality is for under 17-year-olds, the rate of mortality for this virus is exceptionally low. My boys were more likely to have died of influenza over the last year than COVID-19. Um, but very people, most people don't know that. They don't realize that, you know, for little boys outside playing, certainly these days in a post-vaccine America, you know, their chance of falling down and hurting their head is greater than their chance of getting COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but how, how do we get a population that is not hesitant to vaccines? And how do we get a population that understands these risks? I think this is one of the major learning events of this event and will be something critical for the future. Yeah, well, I think one of the difficulties, I think, if we rewind five years ago about talking about pandemic risk is that it's a very, very small risk, but when you get the bad outcome, it's very, very bad, as we've learned. So I guess I want to talk a little bit about where, where pandemics come from and where viruses come from. And um, we think, tend to think of viruses as things that infect us, humans, but a lot of viruses actually come from animals. And so why and how? And you've done a lot of work in the field where you're actually tracking how people are interacting with animals in, in uh, Central Africa and Asia. So tell us a little bit about that. That's right. So when we think of viruses, it's useful to stop and take a moment that the vast majority of viruses on the planet um, are not even concerned with, not only not concerned with humans or mammals, they're not even concerned with um, eukaryotic systems. Most of the viruses on our planet infect things like bacteria and archaea that live in oceans and live in soil. There's a very small percentage of viruses that are relevant to humans, but of that group, the majority of them exist in wild mammal populations, to a certain extent wild bird populations, but we can go back in history and look at all of the major historical events and find that 
all of them virtually, the vast majority are viruses that cross over from mammals and in a few cases from birds into human populations. And so understanding those viruses is really critical to understanding sort of the denominator, if you will, of the viruses out there that can lead to pandemics in people. And so what are those interactions that allow them, what do they look like? I mean, is this like a, a bird poops on me and I might get bird flu? Like, what should we, what are we worried about? Yeah, and there, there is an entire body of study which is the interface between human and animal populations. And I, I did spend a, a good chunk of my career working in places like Sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia trying to look at the interface between humans and wild animal populations. And this can vary from very intimate biological connections such as we see with the hunting and butchering of wild game, which is obviously going to permit viruses from any of the different tissues present in animals to potentially move into human populations. But it can also be interactions that are more indirect. For example, a wild bird, um, perhaps spreading a virus to a domestic bird, like a duck or a chicken, which could then potentially jump to a pig. And so there's a number of different ways in which these viruses are sort of pinging at the as us mm -hmm. as a humanity and that they can mix around and evolve in their process of moving into human populations. And when you were working in sub-Saharan Africa, you were working with hunters, you were um, you know, kind of watching them and seeing them butcher bush, bush meat. How did you, how did you get locals to, to trust you? I mean, no offense, you're a foreigner and you're kind of coming in and asking for their blood sometimes. Yeah, and th this is, um, the right way to do this work is with local scientists. And so the reality is, all of the countries that I've had the good fortune to work in, there's been a range of phenomenal scientists, Ubal Tamofe, for example, who uh, I've worked with for now 20 years in Cameroon. Um, you know, ultimately, this needs to be a local effort in order to engage in you know, public health monitoring of virus populations. And so um, I spent a lot of my time doing this work, but it wasn't necessarily me. It was teams of individuals mm -hmm. that were having this interface. But trust is critical and long-term work and really trying to explain to people openly what, what the risks are and having a public health communication associated mm -hmm. with these kinds, of, these kinds of research efforts. And how, how dangerous is the work of going out and looking for new viruses that we you know, don't understand yet and know nothing about? Sorry. How dangerous is the work when you're going out in the field looking for new viruses? Um, you take tremendous precautions when you do this sort of work. Um, and you know there certainly are dangers associated with it, but, but there's, there's ways to do precautions. And let's not forget that the work is occurring in the context of a daily inter interface between wild animals and humans that's always gonna be more than an order of magnitude more than whatever you know, a, a particular public health official is going to have yeah. in that environment. Yeah, I read a, a profile of you, I think, in The New Yorker that describes you and your team uh, watching a young woman uh, butcher a monkey that her husband has just hunted. And she's there, you know, barehanded. There's blood everywhere because you're butchering an animal. That is what happens. And you and your team are standing by, and you're all wearing face masks and gloves. And that's just such a, such a bizarre image, right? Like, of course, this is what she does all the time. Mm -hmm. You can't exactly force her to wear gloves, but you still have to protect your team. Yeah, there's, there's a range of important um, ethical and public health issues that you engage in when you do this sort of work. And one of them is really sort of sustainability. If you're going to be utilizing masks and gloves in a way that's sort of sustainable, that's a very, very different kind of effort. And mm -hmm. I mean, frankly, it's very easy to misuse gloves um, and it's very easy to clean hands. And that's something that I'm often struck with during COVID is that often you see individuals who are wearing gloves um, and the reality is it may very well be that that is less safe than not wearing gloves in circumstances. Why would it be less safe? Well, because you can wash your hands easily. If, you, if you've been trained appropriately in using gloves and masks, you know exactly how to dispose of them, how to utilize them. You know, they're generally one use mm -hmm. for gloves. So if you're in a situation where people are going to be reusing gloves over and over again, mm -hmm. it actually can facilitate uh, risky activities and, and mm. risks associated with those kinds of things. Yeah, I remember when I first learned to work in the lab, like learning how to take off a glove without touching it was one of the first things you had to learn. That's right, and how often you change a glove. And in some settings, 
you know, there may be an incentive to reuse gloves, which, mm -hmm. which often is going to be a, more risky than mm -hmm. effective hand washing. I see. Well, we've been talking a lot about how animal viruses are spilling over into humans, and this is happening constantly. Um, most of the time, these viruses, they don't become a pandemic because they're not very good at spreading from human to human. In very rare cases, that does happen, and then we get a pandemic. And so you know, that is obviously the prevailing uh, hypothesis for where we think COVID came from. It was probably maybe a bat virus that maybe jumped into humans, maybe through another animal. Uh, we don't know, we cannot trace the entire lineage yet because it's really difficult, right? It's like looking for a needle in the haystack and even with stars, that took many, many years. Um, but there's also a lot of questions right now about could this virus have come from a lab? And I think that's why I wanted to ask you about the, the risks of this research. So I know lab leak is a pretty vague term, so just wanted to spend a minute to unpack it. You know, it can mean a bunch of different scenarios, like one, is, is you, one could say, like, was this a virus that was deliberately released and deliberately engineered? And I think we can agree that's pretty far-fetched. This doesn't look like a bioweapon. Uh, another scenario is, is this a virus that was uh, deliberately engineered but accidentally released? And um, that doesn't have to be nefarious. You know, scientists have conducted what is called gain-of-function research, and this is where you take something like a, a bird virus, for example, and then tinker with it a little bit and see if it's a little bit better in affecting mammals. And we do this because we want to understand how that crossover from animals to humans actually happens. Uh, most scientists I've spoken to say that this doesn't look like a virus that's been engineered, and I think maybe you might, might agree with me about that, though I'm curious to get your thoughts. Um, but that brings us to the third scenario, which is this is a natural virus that was accidentally released. And could it have been that a scientist who was collecting bat samples or was working with bats was accidentally infected? And so I think I just wanted to ask you, like, given that there are some risks involved with this research, and you've done some of this work mm -hmm. where you're going out and looking at bats, um, how do we think about balancing those risks with the knowledge that could be gained to stop these pandemics? Yeah. So. Uh, again, just to summarize, the way that we normally think of these, the introduction of these kinds of viruses would be natural, accidental, or purposeful. Nobody's really th considering COVID-19 from a purposeful perspective. It's more of an accidental or a natural perspective. The reality is that we know the history of a whole range of different viruses, and most of these are natural transmission events. We don't have enough to say clearly what's happening in the case of COVID-19, but I would also encourage us to ask the question of why there is such a focus, why there is such an interest from the media or individuals. Certainly this will be part of the narrative. The story of how this happened is gonna be important. In the case of HIV, it took us decades to find out how HIV crossed into human populations. In the case of SARS, it took us a decade. And my big question when it comes to the origins of COVID-19 is what does it really change about what we do right now for COVID-19? And I think the answer is nothing. And what does it change for what we do for future pandemics, which is the question I focus on? And I think that there's really not much that it tells us about that as well. Well, what about biosafety and like lab safety? No, and again, what I would say is no matter what the origins, there's a, look, myself and my colleagues have been in a long-term discussion about gain-of-function mm -hmm. research. There's nothing new about asking questions about the costs and benefits associated with doing gain-of-function research. And it's also clear that I've spent a good amount of time in my career focused on lab safety and you know, the whole range of biosafety features which are critical when you're developing laboratories. And I think that it's a yes and. Mm -hmm. Clearly, most of the risk that exists for humanity in the future will be from natural introductions. And so whatever systems we come up with that are gonna address these risks are gonna have to focus, as they have in the past, on natural transmission. Either way, it's also important that we have the capacity to monitor individuals who work in laboratories, and I think that's gonna be, no matter what the result of this, a critical and very valuable outcome. It won't be the beginning of that work, yeah. but I think that there'll be a reminder and intensification of that work. Most of the US government partners we work with that are often discussed in the context of working on natural transmission have a huge per percentage of their less sexy programs that are laboratory safety and these kinds of issues. And I think it's gonna be a very important area for the public and for policymakers to think about gain of function research, which really is a question that's a, that's a deeper question and goes beyond 
what scientists should really be commenting about this work. We can talk about the benefits and the cost, but ultimately society is going to have to think about the, the values and costs associated with this research. And no matter what ends up being determined, if there is clear determination, there are still questions on HIV origins that remain unknown to this day. Um, but whatever it is, it's very clear that um, the focus will be on um, ameliorating the future events, and it'll have to be in all three of these different dimensions. Yeah, well, so on ameliorating future events, like what kind of, uh, you've talked about like a kind of always on surveillance system to kind of figure out, to see a pandemic at its birth. So how do mm -hmm. we do that? What clues are you looking for? Yeah, look, and, and I, th let's say it this way, it's very interesting for me as I'm an applied scientist, so I've had the good fortune to do some basic research in subjects like shadow life that are totally unrelated to the nature of pandemics, but fundamentally, I'm an applied scientist, and as an applied scientist, you have, to, you have to continually ask yourself two questions. Number one, what is the objective of my work? And that can change. Number two, what is the technology that permits me to do my work? Because that's also going to change. And if you don't pay attention, you're, you will end up missing the boat. I'm an applied scientist, and I continue to be focused on what I've been focused on over the last 20 years, which is how do we decrease the chance that we have these devastating pandemics? Now, today, I think of this in a fundamentally different way than I did even five to 10 years ago. And again, I think this always on surveillance, always on monitoring is a critical feature of what humans need. But I think there's two pieces to it. One is um, sort of early detection, right? The first time you see a new virus that's entered into human population. And I've spent a decent amount, percentage of my career thinking about early detection. But the other feature to it is the dynamic capacity for populations to respond as a virus has grown, right? So let's think about COVID-19. It's a perfect example. We might have been able to detect it early, earlier than we did. And it wasn't our epidemiological systems that detected it. It was this archaic version of frontline workers saying we're seeing people dying, right? This was not, this was a failure of that epidemiological system. But I might ask the question of, was that the le what led to the disaster? Was the amount of time that we took to detect the event? And it, uh, my sense is that that's really not the reason that the devastation was. It was that, think of what we needed to do. We needed to set up COVID-19 testing in different states. We set up different systems, even to this date, different countries. We don't have standards. We don't have the capacity to compare apples to apples. COVID counts from place to place. And we had to stand this up from scratch. And it was those months that I think were most devastating in terms of the impact of this. So interestingly, I've spent a lot of my career thinking about animals, about early detection. But where I spend most of my time thinking now is, yes, early detection is critical. But I think it's about having these always-on monitoring systems so that when there's a new virus, and the next one, again, it's this great point made in yesterday's session, which is we shouldn't fight the last war. Right? We shouldn't prepare a system which is perfect at monitoring for COVID-19 or Ebola or HIV. Each of these are fundamentally different events. But I think whatever it is should be always on monitoring that can scale such that there's not the need to create a new testing diagnostic system, a new monitoring system that immediately as these new events occur, we know what states they're in. As, as quickly as we possibly can, we can dynamically relate these to response efforts. Right? And I think, at least for me, part of the learning experience for COVID-19 was that early detection is critical, but perhaps it's the always-on, expandable, dynamic scanning and responding, this monitoring that we need to have as societies so that we're not having to scramble every time we have one of these events to stand up these kinds of systems. Well, would you, what are you interested in monitoring in this always-on monitoring environment? Like, what are the pieces of data that you are kind of looking at? Well, it's been really a fascinating time, and technology has fundamentally shifted. So some of you may be familiar with wastewater monitoring. This is the idea. And again, I think we should be cautious, because COVID-19 is what we think of as likely a very GI-tropic virus. In other words, it seems to be very much associated with our gastrointestinal system, in addition to, of course, our respiratory system. So this is like SARS, was something that can be spread through fecal-oral transmission in addition to respiratory transmission. And it, but for that reason, we see it in wastewater. 
and we can actually monitor wastewater to get a sense of the presence of COVID-19 throughout populations. Now, whether that will extrapolate to other viruses is unknown, but it's a new way of thinking of it. There's great work that's being done um, in many institutions looking at mosquitoes as environmental sensors. Can we collect mosquitoes who have blood meals? We now have the capacity to scan through blood meals to understand what are the animals being bitten by the mosquitoes? What are the viruses present in those mosquitoes? And this is great work being done by, by many institutions. We also have this remarkable new technology that I am very focused on lately, which is sort of maybe some of you have heard of the liquid biopsy. Um, we call it cell-free nucleic acids. And with your permission, maybe it's worth like talking about yeah, it. Yeah, please cause do. Because um, it does represent a fundamental shift in the way that we can think about these kinds of events. And so um, all of you will be familiar with amniocentesis. Okay, so amniocentesis is this very costly procedure, procedure and very risky procedure in order to monitor the genome of a fetus in a, in a pregnant woman. Now, um, effectively, amniocentesis, now there's six million women a year who don't need to do amniocentesis anymore. And the reason why is because blood, which circulates in our body, we normally think of it as delivering oxygen to cells, and it certainly does that. But another thing it does is by definition, each of those living cells in your body needs oxygen, so blood has to touch every one of them. And so when your cells die, and cells are constantly dying all throughout your body, including, in this case, in the fetus, there's bits of genetic information that end up in the blood. And one of the most critical biomedical discoveries of the last few decades has been the computational capacity to stitch together these little bits of nucleic acid. And one of the first public health demonstrations was to show that you could, you could basically sequence an entire fetal genome from drops of blood in the, in the periphery. And now, and I've been fortunate to be a part of some of this research, we've demonstrated we can do the same thing with microbes, viruses. So, and this is currently being done for clinical work um, in uh, patients in places like the United States and elsewhere, but effectively, the way that we historically would know the viruses in you would be take a swab and a cerebrospinal fluid and you would need a liver biopsy and I would need a blood specimen and a fecal specimen and a nasal swab. And so necessarily the notion of doing monitoring of populations was something we didn't even really conceive of. But now with some blood we can suddenly scan for all of the viruses and all of the microbes in your gut, in your nose, in your brain, and it really permits us for the first time, along with I think some of these other technologies, to imagine a world, and this is what I'm most excited by. I think we can now imagine a world, a future world, not one many decades from now, but one within a decade, where we can within have a certain population that with a certain resolution we know all the viruses within a group of individuals on say a daily basis or a weekly basis, right? And I know it sounds pretty remarkable, but think again to say GPS and geolocation where we were a couple of decades ago. You know, we didn't have images of every piece of the planet, you know, a couple of decades ago. And I believe and where I'm focused in terms of my own thinking and efforts is can we reach a world where we have a weather map of viruses that's an accurate weather map? And where we can really say within a certain degree of certainty that we know roughly all the viruses in a certain population. And this is beneficial for early detection, but it's also beneficial because these kinds of technologies are agnostic to the particular virus you're looking for. So the COVID-19, part of the COVID-19 disaster that we've heard about and everyone's familiar with is CDC having to develop an assay for COVID-19, and the failures and successes they had with those are irrelevant. We should have always-on systems that are capable of monitoring for all of the viruses present, all of the microbes present within a society, and that's within reach. And, and that's, so that's, what I, that's yeah. what I get excited about these days. Yeah, that's really fascinating to think about. So I, I talked to a lot of geneticists who talk about you know, our new capacities with sequencing, mm -hmm. like doing this cell-free DNA. Um, but it seems like maybe one problem we're hitting is that we can generate so much data now with all of this DNA that we actually don't really know what to look for. Like we're almost, there's almost more than we can computationally really, uh, really um, grapple with. So how do we look for the signal and the noise when you're looking at literally every single you know, microbe and virus in the human body? Yes. There's two answers for me for that. One, 
is baseline. So among the failures of our contemporary epidemiological system was that we, we just simply don't have baselines, dynamic baselines where we're following individuals. So if, if you know everything that's present in human populations, and, and sir, this is a very good point, most of, there's a lot of viruses in this room, right? A lot of, most of the viruses are actually the viruses in the bacteria in your guts and on the, in the bacteria on your skin and in the bacteria on the surfaces. But even if we look at the viruses currently infecting the human cells in this room, there's a, a huge number of different viruses. Most of those are going to have no consequence whatsoever. Now, if we have a dynamic baseline, we'll, be, we'll have a sense of what, what we have in the population, and so we'll be able to detect anomalies. That's one answer. The second answer, I think, is a very important one, because technologies like this cell-free nucleic acid technology permit two things. Number one, they permit not having to do all of the different specimens to get all of the, all of the agents with a, in a particular individual. And that's very valuable. I think arguably the most valuable piece of that. The second, though, is they permit us to sequence everything. And a lot of it is going to be unknown unknowns. There's going to be, but, and I do think this has been a bit of a red herring. I, I increasingly wonder whether early detection may be a bit of a red herring, hmm. but also the unknown unknowns. Most of the important viruses that have led to pandemics in human population have been unknown knowns. Coronaviruses that were new, um, influenza viruses that are new. And so as a consequence, yes, there'll be a great deal to be gained and learned, basic research associated with the unknown viruses that these technologies give us, but a lot of our risk is gonna be simply the unknown knowns that we have, and those will be very easy to detect in these sorts of systems. That, mm -hmm. won't, that will not be noise. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm also interested just to geek out a little bit in the unknown unknowns. Like one of the reasons I like talking to virologists is that they always tell me about these incredible obscure viruses that we've not heard about, but a lot of us have inside us. So I was wondering if you just had like a favorite obscure virus you'd like to tell us about. <laughs> well, um, what, uh, it's some, sometimes the more interesting viruses are the ones that are not obscure, but are they present in everybody. Um, obscure in the sense that they may be in us, but we don't know about it. Yes, like, um, what is it? TTV um, is a virus which is present in just about everybody. We don't know what it's associated with it, what it does. It doesn't seem to be harmful. Um, you know, so look. Um, for me, and I must say, I love the unknown unknowns. And there is a basic scientist deep down in me, and I'm interested in, I'm interested, I spent years um, doing a research project where we looked for non-nucleic acid-based forms of life. And we didn't find any, but the question was, can you develop an assay that would, would see life independent of the DNA and RNA that we know is out there? But I do think, particularly at this kind of moment in history, you know, it really is a focus on you know, what are the things that are gonna be important for future pandemics? And so mm -hmm. I'm constantly trying to smack that part of myself down, yeah. which wants to ask the obscure questions. <laughs> now there is one exception. Let's and I think it. that's an, well, look, um, in terms of not fighting the last war, um, there was a very important war that we haven't finished fighting, but we've basically forgotten it, which is HIV. Now HIV is a very, very interesting virus in a range of different ways. But one of the ways that it's interesting, and most people don't know this about HIV, is you, if you take a look at the time course of an individual who's been infected with HIV, and this is the time, and this is the amount of viruses that are circulating in their blood, immediately you get a boost in viral loads, there's a lot of virus circulating in the individual, and then it's controlled by the body for years before you start seeing AIDS symptoms. Yet most of the transmission of HIV occurs in what we call this primary infection period where you wouldn't even know, many people don't have symptoms, and the symptoms they have are gonna be very generic, fever, some body aches, et cetera. As a consequence, HIV, if we're just looking for syndromes, you would miss a virus like HIV because by the time you start seeing the symptoms, most of the individuals will have already been infected. And if you imagined an HIV that was an order of magnitude more transmissible, by the time we started seeing the individuals who had symptoms, it would have been too late. And so as a consequence, anomalies, even if they're not associated with syndromes, are things that we need to, that's why the sooner we get a baseline, the better it is, mm -hmm. right? Because if you think about a baseline starting in 1970, well, that would have been a baseline that permitted us to see the anomalies of HIV. And so it's, we, we have really no time to waste. Mm -hmm. 
I feel like talking to you that um, going through this period with COVID has made you rethink a lot of the things that you were thinking on earlier in career. Like you were saying, maybe early detection is not as important as you used to think it is. Is that, is that right? Look, and I, I don't want to overstate that. It's some of this is the, the kind of pendulum swing as I spent a lot. I think early detection is critically important. And certainly HIV was a perfect example where early detection would have made a massive difference for that particular kind of mm -hmm. agent. Now, the kind of agent we've experienced in COVID-19, what I'm not saying early detection wouldn't have been important, mm -hmm. but given the failures that ended up sort of cascading after the detection of it, it really wasn't, our failure was not going to be, in the United States, for example, was not going to be changed so much, I believe, by a month or two. Mm -hmm. But I'm not saying early detection is not important, but it's, it's sort of, where is the technology? And early detection will always be challenging. Having an always-on monitoring system in the United States or in other countries that permit us to protect our populations and to scale rapidly the dynamic monitoring and response that's necessary to quench and control these epidemics, that's something which is clearly within sight. And, and again, it, it wasn't always what I was most interested in in terms of viruses, but I think it's what's most important. Mm -hmm. Ditto with animals. I was fortunate to be part of this, uh, a great program called the Global Virome Project, and I would encourage you all to take a look at it. And the idea here is to go beyond the baseline in human populations and to get a baseline in all of the animals out there that have the potential to, to contribute viruses that could lead to pandemics in human populations. And again, technology has made this a conceivable thing to do, where we really know enough about the animals that most of these pandemics come from, and we can sample them, that we could go out and get 90% of the viruses in the world that have the potential to infect humans. And I think it's very important. It's the denominator. You need that denominator. And so I'm not saying that animal monitoring and understanding those viruses is not of importance. I think it is. On the flip side, I also am constantly trying to rethink about what technology we have. And the, one of the most remarkable features, and again, we shouldn't assume this will always be the case, was we had a sequence very quickly after the first, some of the first cases that were identified um, in Wuhan, we had a, a sequence, and then we had the development very rapidly, and next time it'll be more rapidly, of these mRNA vaccines. A lot of the work that I historically did thinking about animals was in a world that didn't have that quick of an adaptive response between identifying a virus and having uh, an agent. And so, you know, 15 years ago, when you couldn't imagine that, or even 10 years ago or five years ago, the notion that we needed to start these animal viruses down the pipeline process for the development of vaccines, such that when these events occurred, we wouldn't be taking three to five years. Well, if it's the case that we can extrapolate on these remarkable findings from these mRNA vaccines, the remarkable efficacy that many of us in this room are actually experiencing right now, that it, technology changes what's important if your objective is not, there's also a useful objective of understanding what's in animals for conservation purposes, for human knowledge, right? This is not just that feature. Mm -hmm. But if, if we're having a laser-like focus on managing and mitigating future pandemics, then we just constantly have to be asking it. And I, I do think it's a bit of a yes and. I'm not, I'm not saying early detection is unimportant. I'm not saying, yeah. I'm just sort of describing my own kind of journey through, the, through these things. I think early detection is critical. I think understanding animal virus is critical, but I think that there's this piece of always on monitoring and thinking of a sort of a defensive um, population-based approach to being able to dynamically within a closed loop be able to understand all the viruses in the population and not to have to suddenly switch gears on your assays and your system when there's a new virus which has entered into a population. And, and yeah, I think that's a good question you're asking of like what, um, what new technologies we now have that obviate some of these things, for example, with mRNA vaccines being so fast and as we're all, most of us are benefiting from. Um, I have one more question before we turn to audience questions, which is that uh, your wife is a playwright, Lauren Gunderson, one of the most produced playwrights in America. Um, she's often written plays about scientists. Her last play was called The Catastrophist. The main character is a virologist, and his name is Nathan Wolf. Uh-oh. <laughs> Maybe so. we can, I can ask my wife to stand up just so you guys can. Um, 
Well, well, now that I put you on the spot, yes. and you have the stage, what would you like to uh, say for the record about your portrayal? <laughs> it is a character. It is, it is not me, is what I would like to say. And um, So my wife, who many of you have been fortunate to meet over the, the past days, is, um, is the most produced playwright in America, after Shakespeare. Um, and, uh, and, and she's fighting hard in that direction. Um, but if you happen to be married to the most produced playwright in America, you learn very quickly not to see yourself in the characters, because there's constantly <laughs> characters and there's little bits of everybody that you see there, and an early error you make in that role of being a spouse to someone like that is to see features of yourself. And I tried to apply the same principle. I mean, this when Lauren writes, it's a, it's a, it's a study that has different features to it. It's a technical bit, and there certainly are, obviously in this case, pieces that that um, reflect upon me. But some of the most interesting features of Lauren's play for me um, were, I don't know, the portrayal of my relationship to my father or my Judaism or things that were in some ways not even remotely related to um, virology or my life as a virologist, but yeah. Yeah, I feel like it must be um, both like enlightening and a little terrifying to see yourself reflected through someone else's eyes, especially someone who knows you so well. I think it was a little bit like the frog being slowly boiled, <laughs> um, you, you know. Um, Lauren, I think well, we should ask Lauren, but I mean, Lauren's take when she, this was early in COVID and she was doing, she, she obviously has all these very close relationships with theaters and one of the, one of her artistic directors um, at Marin Theater, Jason Minadakis, I think proposed, you know, look, we, we need to keep theater going. This is an important part of human storytelling, of human lives, and we can find a way to create theater. And the interesting thing about The Catastrophist is you can, it, it, it's, it is somewhere between a film, it's a one person, um, a play that was um, done beautifully by uh, Bill Demerit and that was filmed in a theater, but as a film. And so it's not like film theater, it's a new art form that's somewhere between film and theater and you can stream it. And it really was a new artwork. And uh, Lauren was originally resistant to it. Um, and I don't remember if I had a particularly strong view one way or the other. I, again, I've learned not to weigh in <laughs> too much because it never ends up well. Um, but. But it was a fascinating process, and it was it was impact it was very impactful for me because there's so much in the play which is personal, mm -hmm. personal features of my life, and you know it's a character, but there were parts of it that were, um, you know, it's an honor. Um, I've had a great career, but you know if you if you're if you don't happen to be married to the most produced playwright in America, with as a scientist like me, you don't end up with a play. So, so it was an honor to have a play written about me. All right, well, let's move to audience questions. I know there are some mics running around. Uh, let's go in the white back there. Hi, and thanks for your comments today. So with what your research is developing in identification and the messenger RNA is uh, providing for um, containing uh, the virus, is this something that, you know, the science is at the point where the next pandemic won't be exponentially larger because of these things, or are we not there yet? Well, look, there's a couple of questions. One we touched upon before, which is, um, I would be thoughtful, again, mRNA vaccines and even vaccinology is not my area of expertise, but, I think we should be careful to extrapolate that the remarkable efficacy we've had from mRNA vaccines for COVID-19 would be applicable to any of the other potential viruses that we could see. We don't even know all the viruses that could potentially infect us. That's number one. But number two, let's just say as a thought experiment, we said mRNA vaccines will be equally efficacious. And again, I think it's a dangerous assumption for not to be cut in YouTube in a way that says this. Even if that was the case, though, and even if we assume that we'll go from, you know, nine months or whatever it was to starting to use these vaccines to a month or two, which I think is likely best case scenario, these viruses can do a tremendous amount of damage in a month or two. And so I believe that the notion that um, we should depend upon vaccines is a, is a very 
kind of uh, dangerous notion, right? Vaccines are clearly a critical feature of this, but we will need to have a baseline, we will need to do early detection, we will need to have always on surveillance, we will need to, frankly, have financial mechanisms that are more effective. Um, I spent much of the last couple of years thinking about, you know, and it's not where my current focus is likely to be because I'm so interested and engaged in the monitoring, but is financial mechanisms associated with um, decreasing damage associated with these events. And it's very important to point out that as devastating as COVID-19 has been for human populations in terms of health and disease, and that's obviously you know, where the most important feature, the economic devastation of these viruses is tremendous. And we need to utilize financial mechanisms and insurance in the same way that insurance um, pools and minimizes risks for other disasters like earthquake and flooding. Um, there's a lot of innovation that will go on outside of this traditional biomedical realm, whether it's you know, improving health communications, finding ways to mitigate financial danger, finding ways to utilize financial systems in particularly developing world contexts where there isn't um, resources like we've seen in some of the Ebola crises to rapidly respond to these kinds of events. And there's great mechanisms from the World Bank and groups like African Risk Capacity at the African Union that attempt to find ways to pool resources and have them move immediately into contingency operations in countries that don't have good funding in order to try to control events that will happen, right? Because again, don't think about China, don't think about coronavirus, right? These are things that, that, are gonna, that are constantly entering into humans everywhere in the world on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Today, there's many new animal viruses that have entered into humans all throughout the planet, right? And so we need to make sure we are not in a mindset which is fighting the last war. I think that is a great point that was made in one of these other sessions. Yeah. Um, are we over here with the baseball cap? Hi. Um, on the economic devastation front, um, obviously insurance is key. Any lease now for space is going to have a pandemic provision. If there's a pandemic, I don't have to pay rent. Um, but I'm talking, I want to switch to human behavior a little bit. So you talked to the, right when you started, the risk of, for the elderly or vulnerable are great. The risk for young people, not so great. Did the Gen Zers and young millennials, did they miss their opportunity to be heroes during COVID where they could have stepped out from the quarantine and said, okay, I'm gonna keep, keep our economic system going, go out, spend money, shop, eat, because you know, obviously it was an economic disaster for small businesses and retail. So just like in World War II where the millennials and Gen Zers of that period saved our country, did the millennials and Gen Zers here miss an opportunity to be heroes by taking the, quote, risk and saving yeah, the economy? Yeah, that's, a, that's a, a great question. And a lot of that, I must admit, is not my own area of expertise. But I think risk literacy, making sure that our population understands relative risk. What's the, you know, how many people died of smoking over the last year on the planet? Well, it was an order of magnitude more than died of COVID. Right? Like, how do we think about these relative risks and how do we engage in health communication such that we don't have problems with vaccine hesitancy where people are not understanding the risk of a vaccine versus the risk to a population associated with a virus with known capacity to be devastating along all these different axes. Um, but I think, I do, I do agree and it, it affects me in my personal life, which is I do think that um, you know, we're fortunate and our school did such a wonderful job with the kids, but um, my little kid, first of all, the other thing is not fighting the last war. We still don't understand exactly why kids are largely spared the most substantive impact of COVID-19. It could have very easily and more expectedly been under 10s and over 80s that had the equal vulnerability. And I would just encourage you to ponder for a moment what the world would look like if that was the case in COVID-19. Um, you know, but I think there's an opportunity to say to kids, you, you don't have to be worried. This is not a risk to you. This is your, part of your, your, your civil service, just like voting, just like, um, like jury duty, right? That 
it's not we're saying you're not wearing a mask to save yourself, you're wearing a mask to save your community. And I felt like maybe some of that that was missing and that there, you know, this is a great opportunity because, you know, you don't know which populations are going to be vulnerable in the next one. All right, let's do one more quick question. Let's do uh, the woman right there in the hat. If you could make it quick, we do have yeah, less than very quick. Um, about liquid biopsies, and you were saying how we could um, enter a time where people could take it daily and you would have a GPS of virus load in different communities. How likely would it be for people to even submit to something like that with um, giving information out to the general public? Look, we're going to have monitoring currently occurs, whether it's in hospitals or blood banks. But look, the hope that I would have would be that um, given the impact of this kind of agent, that all of us would think that a part of our contribution, just like wearing masks, just like being vaccinated, is being a part of the systems that permit us to understand the viruses that are present in our communities to be able to save ourselves from these kinds of events in the future. Um, Sarah, all thank right. you for such a great thank interview. Thank you. Let's thank Nathan.